Let me offer you a personal perspective on, um, on living on a boat. Now, Canal and River Trust's public relations people have, trying, have been trying to uh, get the public to summarise why they love the waterways on Twitter as an exercise in gathering plaudits. It backfired as people were using it to say why they dislike Canal and River Trust. Um, I want to try and summarise that myself, but it will take more than uh, a few characters to give you a completely personal and completely biased look at the many and unexpected benefits of living aboard, including the great characters of the cut. The first is freedom. Today and every day, I can go wherever the canal takes me, and that's probably at the heart of my love affair with Britain's waterways. These narrow stretches of water, sometimes beautiful, sometimes grubby, allow me to have at least the illusion of freedom. Think of all the things that bug you in everyday life. The demands of work, the rising cost of commuting, the sheer frustrations of motorway journeys that stop being journeys, the bills for cancel tax, gas, electricity and water, your credit card bill, whether you'll be made redundant, the garden, the neighbours, the family. Now, moving onto a boat doesn't get rid of them completely, but it puts them a step further away. Even when we lived in marinas, we were still able to have a simpler life. If we need power, heat and water, it's not a matter of signing up to some endless direct debit terms that, uh, that are dictated by a large and corporately stupid supplier. We can buy the next fill of red diesel, gas bottle or bag of coal for cash from whoever offers the best price or service. Our garden can be the biggest in the world as we float through some of the best countryside in all seasons. Or it can be the grow bags and boxes stuffed with salad plants on the roof of the boat. We have the choice. Cars may be a necessity if you need to work away from your vessel, but once you break free from that sort of occupation, they, they become an optional extra along with the garage bills, soaring insurance, super inflated fuel prices. The process of living afloat has for us been one of gradually discarding our anchors to the shore and developing our freedoms based on what we really want. Over 16 years we've shed both our cars, regular television watching, much of our workload, a marina base for our boat and eventually even winter moorings as we gained confidence in our own ability to survive year-round on the cut, whatever the weather. We've also shed much of the inarticulate shyness or insularity that seems to infect modern society, where few people seem to talk to one another and never to strangers. The waterways are a bit like a 1950s village, where most people are happy to chat to anyone who's passing on bank or water. There are exceptions, those who speed past determinedly not looking in your direction, either in a shiny boat or on a bike on the towpath, but every society has its failures. These days, instead of hurrying past to the next appointment with nary a glance, we make a point of saying good morning, how do you do, to every passing boater, towpath walker, angler and cyclist. Some are moving too fast to catch it, of course. Uh, it makes for a much more interesting life, though. And that brings me on to what we've gained. To begin with, it's time. Time to appreciate what's around you, from the unique architecture of the canals, which creates such a respect for the builders, to the scenery and the wildlife, which you see from a different perspective. Few people can sit in some of the most beautiful countryside for hours, watching the swallows and then, as it gets dark, the bats swooping over the water in search of insects as the sun sets over a village church in the valley below. That's something we regularly do at Church Minshaw on the Middlewich branch. Time also allows you to appreciate the amazing history of the system and the industry it grew up to serve. Seeking out signs of the collieries, steelworks, furnaces and factories transforms the grubbier stretches of the Birmingham Canal navigations or the Leeds and Liverpool into a landscape of secrets, 
It also gives an appreciation of the sheer confidence and style of our ancestors who started the Industrial Revolution and built beautiful, awe-inspiring commercial buildings in stone and brick to last for centuries. A sad contrast to the little tin huts that planners allowed to be elected, erected to house industry today. I'll never become one of the slightly obsessive, wonderful people who keep the remnants of our historic fleet of working boats restored and running. I've neither the skill nor the money. But despite that, I am slowly learning more and more about these wonderful vessels and living afloat has allowed me to see many of them gathered at different spots around the system. They're a key part of our national heritage, along with the waterways themselves. And I have a lot of sympathy with one friend who argues that the, the whole thing should become a world heritage site, not just places like the Pontecostithis Aqueduct. At least that would spell out the government's responsibility to look after it properly and keep it operating. What else? Well, I read more, watch TV hardly at all. That's got to be a plus. We have a home our grandchildren are always excited to visit and we get to explore the countryside around the waterways thanks to the bus system and a bus pass. But uh, the biggest plus is the people. Waterways people are almost always interesting, friendly and well worth knowing. If you restrict yourself to talking to people of your class, age or appearance, you'll find it very limiting. But if you reach out in a friendly way uh, to everyone on the cut, it will be a revelation. Inside the scruffiest boats are some of the most interesting people. Dreadlocks or piercings are nothing more than a badge, rather like a barber jacket or a Panama hat. I have to tell myself that even the shiniest boat may contain a person who's not obsessed with the price he's paid for it and is probably worth knowing. Over the past years, we've come across some real characters that have made our life on the cut fascinating and varied. There are a handful who are still genuinely making a living from working boat. Uh, Brian and Anne-Marie on Alton, who turn out in all weathers to serve their customers on the Macclesfield and Peak Forest canals. And now further afield, then there are those who function in the commercial world of boatyards and marinas but retain a, a true interest in the system and its heritage. Simon Jenkins and David Ray here at Norbury Wharf on the Shropshire Union, who saw us through the drama of um, having a new base plate on the boat. Alan and Mike at Scholars Green, where we, we first started out our liverboard adventure. And Adam and Lucian at PB Mechanical on the Leeds and Liverpool, who helped us shape the boat to our needs. There are those for whom our 20 odd years on boats is nothing, of course, because they've been there since the early days. Diane, who first bought a pair of working boats with her husband back in the 1950s, and they're still in the family. Sue, who lives on a converted historic boat and spends much of her time explaining fly boats to modern audiences. Graham and Vera, who fitted out their own boat and lived on board for 25 years until illness forced them ashore. Then there are the liverboards who love having dropped out. Brian, with whom we've spent long afternoons in various pubs. Gaz with his four chainsaws and one leg. Mark, who busks with a didgeridoo. And Ken, gone now sadly, who talked with everyone and loved to rub in the fact that he didn't have to work anymore. There are the historic boat owners who enthuse us with their dedication and even the experienced Canal and River Trust men who help make the system tick. They all become part of our itinerant life as we travel north, south, east and west and they brighten even the dullest days. We may not see them for months or even years at a time but we know that the next time will be as much fun as the last time. Sometimes our grandchildren will unconsciously uh, echo their parents when they ask, are you going to get a house when you get older? I, mean, I tend to tell anyone who'll listen that if I were given a house, I'd probably sell it uh, rather than live in it.
The truth is that we shall stay living afloat as long as we both want to do it and we're both capable of climbing on board and starting the engine.